Good morning. Welcome to worship, everyone. We have uh, begun the Advent season, so we're thinking about Christmas, and we get to enjoy these beautiful decorations that uh, Carol and her dedicated helpers have uh, put in place for us to enjoy, and so we thank uh, all of them for that. This is wonderful. Uh, welcome, whether you're worshiping here in person or online. And uh, so today we're thinking about hope and how we can have hope. There's an order of service for today's worship service on our church app. If you would like to download our app onto your device, please go to wglc.org slash church app. And to help us in our Advent reflections, I invite you to turn your attention to our screen. Advent is a season of waiting. We wait to celebrate Jesus' birth when he came into this world and became one of us in order to save us. And we wait to celebrate the day when Jesus will come again to make us and all things right. During the first week of Advent, we focus on waiting for hope. Listen to these words of hope from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, he will not tire, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you are the hope of the you are the hope in our messy world. This Advent, help us to slow down, listen to your voice, and focus on what's really important. We place our hope in you as we prepare our hearts to celebrate your birth on Christmas. Amen.
Let's stand and sing. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Since we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. There is joy in this house, there is joy in this house today. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Moving into Advent, so we start to sing some Christmas songs, so it's kind of an exciting time. a child is born, unto us a son is given, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, Prince of Peace, glory 
if I were a wise man, I would travel far. And if I were a shepherd, I would do my part, but poor as I am, I will give to him my heart, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore, unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Here within a manger lies the one who made the starry skies, this baby born for sacrifice, Christ the Messiah. Into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears, the promise of eternal years, Christ the Messiah, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and He shall reign forevermore. Forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign. Forevermore, forevermore. Please be seated. In our first reading for today, which is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 to 14, God tells us how to live in this world. We seek the peace and prosperity of the place where he has put us. But our hope is based on God's promise to one day bring us home. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and, div and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will, I will, be, found, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place which, from which I carried you into exile. In today's second reading, which is from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25, we meet Zechariah and Elizabeth, a couple who had no human reason to hope for a child. 
But God heard their prayers and promised that they would have a son, a son who would pave the way for the one who would change everything, the Messiah. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all were assembled, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said, in these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This year we'll be once again gathering a Christmas offering. And uh, this year half of our Christmas offering will be going towards the BC Mission Boat Society for the work that they are doing. And the other half will go to our settlement ministry. And uh, you can give to the Christmas offering online at wglc.org slash donate. And today we have with us Rhonda Kelman, who is the executive director of the BC Mission Boat Society. And she's here to explain a bit about the work uh, that the BC Mission Boat does. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, we are so thankful for the partnership we've had with Walnut Grove over the years. Um, and this last year, having in my office here as the satellite office has been a huge blessing. Throughout COVID, it's been an, an interesting time of ministry as we weren't able to travel into the communities and had to find other ways. And so we were able to do that. Maybe? There. Um, through creating kits and sending them into the communities. And so during the last two summers, we've sent kits, and last Christmas we did, and Easter, and we started a virtual Sunday school, and it was really awesome. Last fall, the communities asked us to send one for every single household in all the communities we serve. And then in January, uh, we reached out to the other communities that have been asking us to go, and so um, we were blessed to send kits into uh, eight communities and to other families that live um, outside of, sorry, of the communities. 
Um, and so this summer we were able to go and do in-person ministry and so we did this with our summer staff so Brittany was one of our summer students or workers that came out and so we were able to travel into Cayucid and Klimtu we were able to hand out our summer kits and see the joy on the faces and parents stopping by and thanking us for sending kits at a time when we couldn't travel so they could still share God's love uh, with their kids and in their homes and so it was awesome to be able to go and do Kids Club and be there in person. Uh, we're hoping in the spring, uh, we're planning more mission trips into these communities for the spring and summer of next year. And so we're hoping with um, the extra financial support and teams uh, that can come in 2022, we can continue going into the four communities that we have been serving, uh, which is Ahadasat and Cayucat, which is on the west coast of the island, Kingcum and Klemtu. Um, and if we have extra teams, uh, we're hoping to go into Ahousit, Gold River, and Bella Bella, uh, which we've been sending kits to. And so just thank you for your prayers and support, whether it's cutting out materials or different things like that. And this Christmas offering will be a huge blessing to our ministry and what we do along the coast. So thank you so much for your prayers and support. And if you'd like more information or anything, just please talk to me after the service. Thanks. If you would like to connect with our car, uh, connect with our church through a card, there's one online. It's our Connect card, and you can find it at wglc.org slash connect, and you can use that. Uh, if you'd like to uh, gain, uh, get information from our church to share with us a prayer request, and we'd be very happy to pray for you. Also, if you have a prayer request that you would like included in the prayers that we're going to be praying together today, later in our worship service, uh, please text uh, those requests to 604-901-5322 before the end of the sermon, and those will be included. And uh, we will be having our Christmas Eve uh, worship service on the 24th, and it's a special time when we can invite people who maybe don't normally go to church, uh, people amongst our friends or family to worship. And so to encourage you in that, I invite you to turn your attention to the screen. And those are the headlines this evening. What a depressing society we live in, Jana. And speaking of depressing, let's shoot it over to Shane Bolt for this week's Christmas forecast. Thanks, Jana. It does seem like there's a high pressure system coming our way, as we see right here on the map. Speaking of high pressure, Mitch, I never got a response to see if you're going to be joining me for church this Christmas. What is happening? Looks like Shane just invited Rick to church. Hey, guys, you're live. Uh, so, Christmas forecast um, looks like... <laughs> uh, how about it, Shane? Is there any snow in the forecast? The weather calls for a silent night, but a holy night. There is a heavenly peace coming in from the north. It just begs the question, Mitch. You want to come to church with me? Back to you. I <laughs> will. I will have to speak to my wife when we're not on live TV. <laughs> Should we go to commercial? All right, but you better make up your mind because church service fills up quick. What do you say? Come on, come to church with me. Back to you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Breaking news. Seems like Mitch just left baby Jesus out in the cold. So today is the first Sunday in Advent, so that means that there's four Sundays and then it's Christmas. Are you guys kind of getting excited? Maybe this week if you have one of those calendars and you can open a door and get a chocolate or something like that, it's kind of exciting, isn't it? And, and we heard Charlotte say in, when they were lighting the Advent calendar candle, it's the time of waiting. Do you guys like waiting for Christmas? Is it kind of hard to wait for Christmas? Do you even like waiting? I don't particularly like waiting. I don't like waiting for people. I don't want to keep on waiting for the time when I don't have to wear my mask. 
kind of tired of waiting for things. And I found this poem written by Dr. Zeus, and it's called The Waiting Place. Waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow, everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. In the Old Testament, they were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for a Savior. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas when Jesus came. And now we wait again. And we wait for Jesus to come back. And we do all this preparation to celebrate Christmas. But we also have to do some preparation for when Jesus would come back. And maybe we have to think about what we can do for that. How can we prepare? What can we think about in our lives? And what can we do while well, we wait? I know one thing, and that's the theme of today is hope. And while I prepare for Jesus to come back, I don't want to lose hope. On a day when the rain is raining and there's all this bad news, I think the best preparation that we can have is to have hope in God. Hope that Jesus will come back and that he's here loving us right now. I'd like to pray about that. Dear God, you give us hope as we wait for your return to this earth that seems to be in a lot of despair right now. Help us to keep on to that hope because we know you are with us and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to follow along with today's sermon, there's sermon notes on our church app. And the title of uh, the message today is Hope. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Lord, it seems like we need hope as much as we need uh, oxygen to live. And uh, there are times in life when it seems like it's pretty hard to hope. And yet you are a God who came into our world to give us hope that endures. And so, Lord, as we reflect on your word today, we pray that you would speak your words of hope deep, in our, deep into our hearts and help us to live by them. And we pray these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. So, about a month after I turned 15, I came with a whole bunch of other young people out to Vancouver for a national youth gathering. And it was the first time that I had been away from home, away from my parents, away from my family for an extended period of time. And I was terribly homesick. And there was one uh, time during that uh, stretch when I was away where I phoned my parents and uh, so I'm lonely, I'm sad, and yet I actually couldn't bring myself to tell them what I was feeling and why. So when they asked me what's wrong, I said, I forgot to bring a nail clipper. <laughs> well, of course, they knew what was really the problem, and my dad teased me about that incessantly after I got home. Every human being from time to time feels homesick for a world to which they have never been. These longings tend to be strongest when things don't go the way we hope and a dream dies. Or when someone we love turns their back on us and a relationship dies. Or when an accident happens or a disease takes its toll and a loved one dies or when we are no longer able to overcome the challenges of life and it becomes our turn to die. We all somehow know that things are not supposed to be this way and we cry out for a better world. 
And this makes sense because we read in the Bible that every human being was made in the image of God. And therefore, there is within every human heart an innate desire to live in the presence of God. And that is what heaven is. Life in the presence of God. All human beings were created for life in God's presence, for life in heaven, and that is true even if we don't believe in God. But those feelings of being homesick, of being separated from the life that we should be living, are even stronger for someone who follows Jesus. For in the moment when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, what happens is that he brings to life within us a new person. That new person is a new creation, a citizen of heaven, a beloved, forgiven child of God who loves God with all of their heart, soul, strength, and mind and loves their neighbor as themselves. This new person is in the world, but not of the world. And we know that from John 17, where Jesus, as he prayed for his followers, said these words, They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So what do we do when we feel isolated and alone, where we feel like, in a world where we feel like we don't belong? Two common approaches that we human beings often use is to either compromise our beliefs so that we do fit in with those around us, or we self-medicate the loneliness away with our drug of choice, which could be retail therapy, food, clothing, alcohol, drugs, gambling, or other harmful substances or behaviors. But what is uncommon is the approach that God gives us, which is to wait. And in Psalm 27, we read, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Now, it's fitting that we are thinking about waiting in this time of year because this is Advent, the season of the church year that we are now in. It's a season of waiting. We wait for the day when we can celebrate the birth of our Savior who came, and we wait for Him to come again to bring us the heavenly life that we all long for. And so the question that I have for you today is this, how do we have hope as we wait? And to help us as we Uh, think about these things and wait. We are starting a new series today called The Promise of Advent, and our theme for today is hope, and the passage that we're going to be looking at is Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 14. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. And as you do that, let me share with you some background information that will help you to better understand what is going on in our passage for today. This passage is from the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah during a very tumultuous time. In April of 597 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the capital city of Jerusalem, or capital city of Judah, which was Jerusalem, and he defeated it, and he took into exile the king of Judah, most of his family, all of his leading officials, his army, and the country's craftsmen and artisans. But that Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, left behind uh, the king of Judah, who's Jehoiachin, uh, left his uncle behind, Zedekiah, as a puppet king. However, the only people that puppet king had to rule over were the poor of the land. Now, God's people were divided. The best and brightest were separated from their homes, their land, and many of their people. Those left behind were separated from their leaders, the economic engine of their land, and from many of their people as well. 
Nobody's life was left untouched by the devastation the Babylonians caused. And the question that God's people began to ask, which is the same question people have been asking since the beginning of time, is how do we have hope? And the way that some of the prophets in Babylon answered that question was to do what we human beings often do, and that is they came up with a human solution. Prophets, you see, speak God's word to God's people, which is kind of what a pastor does in our current context. And the human solution of these prophets in Babylon was to speak for God and make promises that God did not make in order to give God's people hope. But a hope that's based on a false promise is a false hope. And trusting in a false hope will shatter the person who believes it when that false hope fails, as it inevitably will. So this is why Jeremiah's work as a prophet was so important. He had to counteract the lies of the false prophets, and even though those lies were what the people of that time wanted to hear. And he also had to declare to the people the truth of what God was saying. You see, the people of Judah were defeated by Babylon and separated from their God-given home as punishment from God for turning away from him to worship other gods. And what the people needed in this situation was repentance, a change of heart and mind, where they turned away from their old sinful ways and turned back to God. And the problem, the really big problem, with the false hope that the false prophets were giving to God's people is that it stopped the process of repentance and it cut off the people from what they really needed from God, which was to be realigned and recentered in Him. So Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles in Babylon, and in that letter he said three things. First, he said, settle and seek peace. The lying prophets were saying that God was going to bring the exiles back from Babylon in a couple years. But God told the people through Jeremiah, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. God knew that it was going to take time to undo the corrosive effects of centuries of idolatry in the hearts of God's people. He knew that it was going to take decades, not months, to do this. God's people in Babylon were going to have to stay there for 70 years, God told them. And God also knew that things were going to get worse before they got better, because within that 70 years, the Babylonian army would go back to Jerusalem and totally destroy the city and the temple there in 586 B.C. God's people needed to learn repentance and God-dependence. And it takes time for those things to happen. So God told the people to settle down and live fruitful lives while they waited. But God also said to them, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, can you imagine how radical this is? God is telling his people to pray for and work for the peace and prosperity of their national enemies. And what makes this command even more daunting is that the Hebrew word that we translate as peace and prosperity is much more than the way we think of it in terms of financial well-being, perhaps, and a lack of war and hostility. You see, in this verse, each time the English word uh, 
peace or prosperity is used, the Hebrew word behind it is shalom. And shalom means more than peace. It has this sense of wholeness, wellness, and completeness in all aspects of life. So if we go back and we read the passage again with the word shalom in it, in the place where it was found in the original Hebrew, it would sound like this. Also, seek the shalom of the people to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it experiences shalom, you too will experience shalom. So God's people were to be conduits of God's shalom wherever he placed them, even in the land of their enemy. Now the second thing that God told the exiles through Jeremiah's letter was sift truth from lies. God's people had to be on guard against truth claims that were not true, even if they were made by well-meaning people. So God said, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. We used to have a doctor in our church whose name was Norm. And there was a time where there were some events going on and people were uh, very stirred up by them. But Norm wasn't stirred up at all. And when I asked him why, he told me something that stuck with me. He said, I take everything I hear and see, and I filter it through the Bible. And I thought to myself, what wisdom? You see, a practice like that helps us to hear things and then sort out the lies from the truth and then take in what is true and cast aside what is not true. Now, the third thing that God told the exiles through Jeremiah's letter was scare, square, sorry, square your uh, heart and mind with God's promises. He told the exiles, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God's first promise in this passage is to bring his people home. And God will do that according to a time that he, not humans, knew was the right one. God's second promise in this passage is that he has plans to shalom them to give them hope and a future. And again, the word behind prosper in this passage is shalom. And so God is telling his people that that they are not only going to be conduits of his shalom, he's also telling them that they can align and rest their hearts and minds on his promise that he will bring his ultimate shalom wellness to them in the future. So what does this mean for you and I? We are in the same situation as the exiles in Babylon. We don't belong in this world. Sometimes we are hated by the world. The world is not our home, and yet we are here. What do we do? We do what God told the Israelites to do through Jeremiah. We settle down and seek shalom peace for the place where he has put us. We sift truth from lies. And we square our hearts and minds with God's promises. For the God who loved the Israelites even while they were in exile is the same God who also loves us even as we live exiled from our home in heaven. And just as God faithfully kept his promise and brought his people home to Judah decades later, so also God faithfully kept his promise first given to Adam and Eve 
to send a Messiah who would undo all of the brokenness and destruction caused by sin, rescue humanity from our bondage to sin and death, and bring us back to our proper home, the healed and restored new heaven and earth, which Jesus will recreate at the end of time. Imagine what our lives could be like if we stopped placing our hope on the things of this world and instead placed our hope solely on Jesus and his promises for the present and the future. And what are those promises? Well, the two that pertain especially to our reflections today are found uh, first in Hebrews 13.5, which reads, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And then in John 14, where Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Dear friends, we don't need to be worried or afraid in troublesome or tumultuous times, because Jesus is with us, and he has promised to bring us home. And that is a hope that will never, ever be shaken. Now to help you grow in having more of that unshakable hope, uh, today's challenge is based on the fourth thing that God told his people through Jeremiah's letter. God said when we believe that he has good plans to give us shalom, peace, and prosperity, then this is what happens. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. My friends, the challenge that I'm leaving with you today is to seek the Lord with all your heart. By going to the cross, dying for us, and rising again, Jesus has made it possible for us to live in the presence of God right now, even as we wait for the fullness of God's presence in the future. You are citizens of heaven. And Jesus will help you to trust that God has good plans for you, and he will help you to live a heaven-centered life. You and I need the shalom wellness that Jesus gives. But the people around us also need the shalom wellness that Jesus gives. And you or I might be the way that he chooses to give it to them. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your promise to always be with us and your promise to one day bring us home. Thank you for making all of this possible by coming into the world as a baby in a manger and going to the cross as a man to suffer and die for all of humanity and then rise from the dead to give us the sure and certain hope of resurrection life with you. And so we pray, Lord, that as we prepare during this Advent season, you would help us to keep our hearts and minds focused on you. Help us to seek you with all our heart. In your precious and holy and matchless name we ask this, And everyone said, Amen. So the busyness of this time of year makes it very easy for us to go off track in our lives. So let's recenter ourselves in God's love by admitting to him our need for forgiveness. I invite you to stand if you're able and let's say these words together. God of tenderness and love, 
breathe your grace into our lives. Forgive our wandering ways and guide us along your paths of peace. When we lose our way and forget the reason and purpose of this season, carry us back to you. Lead us up to that high mountain of faith and hope that we might truly proclaim, here is our God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from God through the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, comfort, says your God. Your sad days are gone and your sins are pardoned. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Please be seated. I'm standing outside of our church building just to remind you that though the work that we do inside the building is very important, it's uh, work that prepares us to do uh, work that is in some respects even more important outside the church. And that is to be uh, uh, salt and light in the world, to be people that uh, help others to know Jesus and uh, and be drawn to him as their Lord and Savior as we share the hope that we have been given with others. And so uh, I, we've got big things in, uh, in mind for our church as we try to reach the people of, of uh, Walnut Grove, Willoughby, Langley, Abbotsford, Surrey, and, and uh, beyond. Uh, in 2022, we want to begin planning a new ministry that will help us to uh, reach the people of our community. Uh, we don't even know what it is at this time, but uh, we'll plan for it in uh, 2022. And uh, in 2023, we want to actually start doing it. And uh, sometime in the next eight years before the year 2030, we want to host a conference where we will invite other Lutheran churches from the Lower Mainland to come and learn with us about how to make disciples who make disciples. Because we want to be a church that helps people of all generations to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. And so to pull this off, it's going to take all of us working together. It's going to take all of our prayers. It's going to take uh, all of our uh, energy um, combined as uh, God's spirit works in and through us. Uh, But it'll also take uh, some financial resources as well. So if you'd like to partner with us in this great and wonderful mission that God has given to us, you can do that by giving online at wglc.org slash donate. Or if you want to set up an ongoing giving relationship with us, if you haven't done that already, uh, you can email our church office at admin at wglc.org, and we can set that up for you. And if you're worshiping with us today in person and you brought your offering with us, you can leave it in the basket on the table as you exit our worship space after worship today. God's bless us. I invite you to stand if you are able for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of the people who have been impacted by the floods in our province in any way. We pray for those, uh, we pray for your comfort for those who are grieving. Uh, We pray that you would be with those who have been Uh, driven from their homes, and uh, this morning there's new word that there's another evacuation uh, order given in uh, parts of uh, Abbotsford. We pray that you would uh, provide people with all they need as they are away from their homes. We also pray, Lord, for all those who have suffered material losses, who have maybe lost their homes or lost their livestock or equipment. Uh, during this uh, terrible time. Lord, we pray that uh, somehow, some way, you would bring restoration. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would prevent uh, further flooding from happening. And we pray, Lord, for all those who are uh, working to keep our roads safe and uh, are working to repair our roads. 
Uh, watch over them, Lord, and protect them, we pray. We pray, Lord, for peace in our troubled world. We pray for those who have been driven from their homes because of war or violence or natural disaster or persecution. And we pray for restoration. We especially pray for the Tariq family, Tariq, Shazia, Irene, Sarah, Simon, and Solomon. We pray that you would watch over them all and that you would keep them safe. We, we ask that especially that you uh, keep Tariq healthy. And we ask that you would hurry up the, the process that needs to happen, Lord, so that they could come to Canada soon and we could help them to uh, begin a new life here. Lord, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there is so much uh, which would concern us. And now there's news that there's a new variant of concern uh, in parts of the world. And so we pray, Lord, for all those who are making uh, big picture decisions, those in uh, government and uh, health, and we pray that you would bless them and, you, and that you would guide them. And we pray also, Lord, uh, for those who are on the front lines, all medical workers and others such as uh, teachers and first responders. Uh, bless them and watch over them and keep them safe as well. And Lord, uh, uh, most of all, we pray that you would uh, help those of us who follow you to keep our eyes on you and to not be... Uh, unsettled or thrown off track by what is happening in the world today. And help us, Lord, we pray that uh, because of the hope that you give us, we could be people of hope uh, during a very difficult time in the world. We pray for all who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And today, we especially pray for Deaconess Sre Mue, who serves as a Bible teacher at Garuna Christian Church in uh, Cambodia. And she's also studying at the Lutheran Institute for Southeast Asia. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, Deaconess Mue and that you would um, watch over her and keep her safe, that you would provide for her all that she needs to do the work that you are calling her to do, and that you would work in and through her in a powerful way uh, to draw the hearts of more and more people closer and closer to you. Lord, we pray for all who are grieving. Uh, we pray for me and my extended family as we grieve the death of my cousin Corinne. And also for all who are grieving the death of Heidi's Uncle John. We pray for Pastor Michael Kay and his wife Christine and the rest of their family as they grieve the death of their daughter Naomi. And for Scott P. and all the other friends of Dario who are grieving his death. And for April and Barry M. and all of April's family as they grieve the death of April's father, Hermilo. And for Dawn and Deanna S. and family, and for Dawn's sister Mary Lynn and her family, as they grieve the death of Mary Lynn's husband, Ted. We also pray, Lord, for others who we know are grieving, and we now name them before you in the silence of our hearts. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross and rising again to give us the sure and certain promise of resurrection life. We pray that you would wrap your arms of love around all who are grieving and comfort them with your presence and your promise of life eternal with you. We pray, Lord, for all those who are going through a difficult time and need your rest, your comfort, your encouragement, and your strength. We lift up to you Earl and Marion and their family, and we also lift up Stephanie G, and we pray that you would uh, watch over them, Lord, and help them and uh, carry them through the difficult times that they're facing. We pray for those who are in need of your healing touch, for Mike M., who's recovering from heart surgery, for Jordan R., who's also recovering from surgery, and Diane R., who will be having hip replacement surgery on December 13th. 
And for Susan G., who's recovering from arm surgery, and Tara's friend Mark M., who has COVID, and Clarissa's dad, who's already suffered cancer and will now need open-heart surgery. For our Premier, John Horgan, who's been diagnosed with cancer and is taking treatments. We pray for healing from harmful addictions for Jody C. And we pray for Maddie, who's in the middle of his third round of chemo and still dealing with low-pressure hydrocephalus. And we pray that progress continues and the tumor keeps shrinking. We pray for Bryant G's dad, Lori, who will be receiving radiation treatment daily for four weeks. And we pray that the cancer does not spread. We pray for Bob J, who is convalescing after a stroke. And we pray for the health of Ryan V's father. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that Ryan was able to visit him and that you brought him back safely. We pray for others who are in need of your healing touch, including Tanya, Glenn P., Shauna, and Otto, Marlene B., Elizabeth P., Gail, Todd, Patty, Donna L., Julianne L., Pastor Carl, Lynn, Damaris K., and Ruth H., and for others who we know need your healing touch, we now name them before you in our hearts. Dear Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing whenever it happens. And so we pray that you would strengthen our loved ones, both in body and in spirit. Help them to know that you are always with them, you always love them, and they are forever safe with you. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name. And we pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As our time of worshiping God together comes to an end, and you go out into the world to share God's love with a broken and hurting world, go with this blessing from God. May God himself, the God of hope, peace, joy, and love, make you perfect and holy and keep you safe and blameless in body and soul for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, both now and forever. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms you see his open arms for God
God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. So love the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Come on back next week.